This is Talking Mule Deer with your hosts, Steve Belinda and Jody Stemmler. Talking Mule Deer takes you on a journey to learn more about the Mule Deer Foundation, Mule Deer and black tailed Deer Biology and Management, tips and tactics for hunting, conservation issues, and even features some of our corporate and celebrity partners. Now, let's start talking Mule Deer. Hi, I'm Jody Stemmler. We're here with MDF Podcast from the Western Hunting and Conservation Expo. And I'm Steve Belinda, and right now joining us is C.J. Buck from Buck Knives. Welcome, C.J. Hey, great to be here. Thanks so much for stopping by today. And, and actually, um, for those of you who have been listening to the podcast, you may have heard some uh, what sounds like tooth drilling. That's because CJ's booth <laughs> is right across the aisle from us, and he's so popular that any time somebody asks him to sign his ni- their knives for him, he's out there doing that. So yeah, uh, We have an air-powered... Uh, an air-powered little tool actually uses a dental burr. <laughs> well, uh, so that's I could why tell. it sounds just like it. But well, the hair on the back of my neck's been standing up every time I hear that. What are you talking about? You said you can't hear it. It's that frequency well. <laughs> that your bad ear can't pick up. Steve. Well, when Come I on. turn my right ear towards that, that's what it picks Perfect. up. Perfect. So. Well, CJ, thank you for joining us today. You uh, obviously are a, a member of the well-known buck family and buck knives has been Mm -hmm. in your family as a family business for years so tell us a little bit about your grandfather and the starting the business and yeah it's a it's a fourth generation company actually now fifth generation company because i have a son daughter and son-in-law all all working within the business my great grandfather started making knives in 1902 he was an apprentice blacksmith in leavenworth kansas Um, it was just a hobby just a little something on the side that he could make a little money on. And in 1945, he moved, relocated from Mountain Home, Idaho, down to San Diego, California. <laughs> Him and his wife moved in with their oldest son, my grandfather, Al Buck. And they worked together for about three years. H.H. Buck and Son Lifetime Knives. Guaranteed them for life. Best quality they could af- do. Their own craftsmanship. Uh, warranty it for life. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> passed away in 1949. My grandfather kept it going as just a custom knife business right there near the house. Uh, in 1961, we incorporated, introduced the 110 Folding Hunter in 1964, and it just went to the races after that. So it's a big-time family business. Absolutely. You know what I find interesting, actually, hearing you tell that story? We had Adam Weatherby on yesterday mm-hmm. morning. His grandfather started Weatherby, moved from Kansas to Southern California yeah. in the 40s also, yep. and started it. So the, the, these long-time well-known names in the outdoor industry, family-run businesses, have a very similar start. They do. Um, and, and a continued commitment to both family conservation, um, working, in, yep. and, and commitment to the industry. So... So after your grandfather incorporated as a business, I know, you know, your father was very involved. I, my father-in-law remembers seeing Chuck at shows, and, and I remember meeting you many years ago at an OWA conference. Yeah, no, my, my father was very much involved in, in interacting with customers because the best feedback you get on your products comes straight from customers. Yeah. So he loved hearing that firsthand. My focus, uh, kind of a different new focus for us, is really getting much more involved on the conservation side. That's just been a personal interest so I still love being here at the expo interacting with customers hearing what they like what they don't like autographing knife blades great great interaction uh, I love putting somebody's first knife on their on their <laughs> knife blade because you know lots of fathers buying knives for sons daughters it's just it's awesome well if but I'd have known you were doing that I would have brought uh, my folding hunter down one I've had for a long time it's an indestructible knife <laughs> I mean I don't know what you guys do but I've had other knives fall apart using it. I've got this thing I carried in my, my hunting pack. It's my go-to knife. And, I man, the thing is beat up, but it still performs great. So thank you for making I don't know what you do, but well, keep you, doing it. If so. you're going to warranty something for life, and we actually go beyond life, we go forever. Yeah. If you're going to warranty something that strongly, it it better last or you're Absolutely. just shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah, it's not good business practice no, if you make a product that's going to break and you have to keep replacing it, right? <laughs> So, yeah, high-quality knives. Um, and you do more than just the, the hunting knives, too. You have a lot of other products in your... Yeah, we, we, have, uh, we have everyday carry products. We have some tactical products. We do some kitchen products. So anything with an edge is fair game. Yes. Well, I have. we, we talked last year because I saw uh, you don't have it this year, but I am coveting you have this incredible kitchen knife set, a full set with antler handles on it. Yes. So at some point mm. in my life... That will be on my counter. Cause I, Casey, if you're listening. I know, right, exactly. <laughs> Christmas present <Yeah>. idea. <laughs> and we actually worked, um, we worked to get some mule deer antler that we put on, on a steak set. And, oh. and I love building stuff 
I love building stuff for auction items that has intrinsic connection to the organization we're trying to support. Yeah. Those are just those are just fun fun to make. That's that's neat. You comment the organizations you're trying to support. Uh, you are a part of the MDF board, um, and you have been yeah. for an, a few years. Yeah, this is this is my seventh year, seventh and last okay. year Aww. on the board. So I I cycle off. You gotta. You got to make room for, for new losing. people and new ideas, but no, you're not losing me. No, well, that's good. Uh, so, you've seen a lot of change in MDF and oh, yeah. the Western Hunting and Conservation Expo over those seven years that you've been involved. Tell me a little bit about what you've seen for the show first, and then we'll okay. talk about the organization. Well, you know, the first year I was here, um, I, ha I had I met Miles Moretti through the Boone and Crockett club he's a professional member of the boone and crockett club we were we were just a licensee this was before i became a regular member of the of the club and and am now a board member with uh, boone and crockett so in 2010 came here and I'm, i've been showing people all day that that uh there's only a fraction of this room was filled with the show right and some of the booths were kind of junky kind of booths and i mean this show has just expanded so much yes. it's it's such a high quality show and what i'm noticing is that we're starting to attract you know the best of the best in our industry who've heard about the show and want to be here yeah well for me it was amazing when you walk around you walk up to a booth the owner's there or the president's there and they engage with you i mean you don't see that at a lot of their shows and like you say you're not seeing the pillows and the blankets like we used to they're, yes they're the there yes. we still have something I mean, there's something for everybody yeah. here yeah. but it's absolutely you've got the best in the industry and you've got the best representatives of those companies um here on the floor yeah. too and the people who know their product best for sure so that's been pretty yeah. neat and the traffic the, the increase in traffic and the people recognizing you know, that just coming through once it once a show gets a momentum that drives more traffic, which drives better exhibitors, which drives more traffic. It really is if if you've done your homework and you've done it right. And I have to, you know, kudos to the to the MDF uh, staff that have just put on a fantastic show here. Uh, same with uh, Sportsman's Professional Wildlife. Yep. Just this this combination of putting on this amazing show. There is a momentum here, and it's just going to get better. Yeah. And you know, uh, Jody and I both have natural resource degrees. Uh, I've worked as a biologist for a long time. It's it, having someone like yourself come out and say, I'm con I want to get involved with the conservation side of this. I'm just not here to sell product is very, very encouraging to folks like us and to the organization. Tell us what you feel is some of the most important things on the conservation side that you're interested in that you're helping MDF address. You know, there's, there's really two main issues with the conservation side, uh, and they both involve communications, which I love. Uh, a, a marketing major in college, love the, I love the communications and the messaging. I love reaching people. Conservation has two issues. One of them is funding, uh, but the second issue is opinion. And... Uh, Conservate, hunting is, is the, the most basic and the best wildlife management tool that we have as a, as a species, as mankind. We don't have a better way to manage wildlife populations. So I'm, I'm an Idaho resident. We got a lot of wolves in Idaho uh, 20 years ago. Utterly decimated the elk populations. Utterly decimated the whitetail and mule deer populations. Um, and that's finally starting to work itself through as Idaho makes life uncomfortable for wolves and wolves start moving into other states. But <clears throat> there was no on and off switch with wolves. When you talk about hunters, there's seasons, there's bag limits. You have a volume switch. You have an on and off switch. That is exactly what you need to manage wildlife. Because when you think about us as a nation... We are not one big contiguous wilderness anymore like we were 200, 300 years ago. We're almost little garden patches of wilderness. And those things, they don't have the benefit of if you decimate one of those patches, it used to be that the wilderness around it could come repopulate that area. That doesn't really exist. The, you know, people are living in these areas. We've got these corridors, but the, you know, these things have to be managed much better then you can't just a hands-free, you know, keep man out of the forest and everything will go well. No, that's not the way it works anymore. Well, and, you know, uh, hunters have always stepped up to the plate when they've 
been needed, when they've been asked. And let's face it, they regulated themselves 100-some-plus years ago. Mm-hmm. They're the ones that said, we need to rein ourselves in so that we have this resource for a long time. And, you know, we see a lot of damage concerns with private landowners and trying to grow crops, and we see predators getting into their herds. And, you know, I, I love it when the states turn to hunters to help address those problems rather than doing it through a call or through sharpshooters because it, it shows how folks are willing to step up and do that. Well, well, when you think about from a government standpoint, and we talked a little bit about funding, hunters pay for the privilege to properly manage wildlife versus having a government service have to fork over tax dollars to accomplish those same goals. It just seems ludicrous to me that you would take a system that's working flawlessly. I mean, wildlife populations have exploded. I mean, we all see them on the sides of the roads getting hit by cars because there's so many deer and there's so many elk. These are huge success stories that we should be celebrating the North American model of conservation, rather than having certain organizations like the Humane Society continuously attack this system that's worked so flawlessly. Well, I I worked, when I was working for a state fish and wildlife agency in the early part of my career, I remember my director saying, uh, one of the biggest challenges we're gonna face is when the general public starts to think of wildlife as more as a nuisance than as the asset and the, you know, and, and the bounty that we have for many years because yep. there's so many in an urban population that don't want the deer nibbling on their, their you know, landscaping plants or, or when they get hit by a car. So finding that proper balance of being able to appropriately manage the species and keep people caring about their wildlife resources on a broader level, it's, it's really important. Yes. Well, and you know, you talked about communications. One of the reasons that uh, Jody and I work so well together is because she's a great communicator. And I'm not very good at it. And when I go around... At least he admits it, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, she's heard this before. Why people don't know about our success, the model, the recovery. Because we care, you know, we get our heads down and that's what we love to do. We don't think about the communications. We suck at it. And yeah. we're not turning to professional people that have degrees, that have skills to go out and do that. And we are beginning to learn that saying, you know what, you look at the Hug a Hunter campaign in Colorado, mm-hmm. that was developed by a marketer and someone in professional communication. A lot of the staff thought it was hokey, but it works. And so I'm super encouraged that folks like yourself and, and people like Jody are out there helping us biologists and folks that need that help to get the word out. Well, and this is something that I know is near and dear to your heart um, through Boone and Crockett and Mm -hmm. others is unfortunately a large, maybe not a large segment, but there's a segment of the hunting community who may be not telling the right kind of a story to a public right now. And that's a big concern for a lot of people both in the industry and outside because it's creating a much bigger backlash in this world of social media and fast, rapid information where a picture can fly to millions of people in seconds. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the, the initiative you're working on with Boone and Crockett and others about trying to reclaim our ethics, our conservation values as hunters, to reclaim that. So one thing to keep in mind is that... Uh, and there's only 7 or 8% of people who are really active hunters in our country. There's another 15 or so percent that are avid anti-hunting. And then there's that broad swath in the middle that think, you know, if people are hunting for f- food and they're hunting responsibly, I got no problem with it. And so it's those people that actually have the power to take hunting away from all of us. So what Boone and Crockett set out to do, it, we're, we're, we're in our second year of a two-year campaign. Uh, <clears throat> it's called the Hunt Right Campaign. And, and basically, we want to help train hunters to be good brand managers for the sport of hunting. Because as a hunter, anytime you're talking about that in a public forum, not just privately, you have, you're a brand. Hunting is a, yes. a brand. So that's the, what you're trying to say is... Yeah. You have to think about how you're portraying yourself, not just yourself to the people you know, but how that can get expanded out broader than that, right? Yes. As a brand manager yes. for a company, you think about that all the time, right? Yes, oh, all the time. Right. And it's not about trying to judge the actions of others. It's just being responsible in how you take photographs. Try and be respectful to the game. Be respectful to the animal. Uh, as you're posting social media posts, be respectful. You know, Something you'd be proud of. Uh, th- there's just some really simple 
uh, there's really simple things that we as hunters can do that just give a lot less ammunition and also learning, learning some of the background of, 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 say, the North American model. A lot of people have no idea of the success or how to portray that success to somebody who doesn't, who isn't a hunter and doesn't know. So this campaign is, is a challenge to some folks to you know, up their game a little bit in how they represent hunting. And it's also a challenge to learn some of the background so that if somebody has a valid question, you have the ability to answer that question. So Boone and Crockett has a website called, um, uh, I hate it when I don't get it, these right, but I think it's, it's hunt, hunt right dot uh, no, it's no. hunt fair chase. Uh, and I don't know if it's dot org or dot com. I, I know but I'm you, supposed to know But you can go to things, the Boone and Crockett website, and it'll, you can find it pretty easily. Yeah, there. if you search Hunt Right Campaign or Hunt Fair Chase, it's I, it's going to come up. But there's a lot of there are windows that you can click that tell these different stories and yeah. tell the background of of what's happened, what's been successful in the conservation movement. So people can educate themselves and, and be good brand ambassadors for uh, the sport of hunting. Because it's, it's critical. It, 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 it drives me insane that, it's, that hunting is so crucial to wildlife management. And we actually are running the risk. And we've seen it in, other, in states where ballot initiatives have eliminated different hunts. And they just kind of divide and conquer. And people don't realize that those were... You know, you're taking wildlife management out of the hands of the scientists and the wildlife biologists and putting it into ballot initiatives that are drawn by a few commercials and a lot of emotion, and, and, yeah. and it's not best management practice. You certainly wouldn't run your business that way. Right. It's ridiculous to manage wildlife that way. So, well, in real quick, it's HuntFairChase.com. 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 And, um, and it has a, a tremendous amount of information, including a series of, uh, under their Learn tab. It, mm -hmm. There's a series of, of, of essays or articles providing suggestions and why, it, reminding you of the ethics, the basic fundamental ethics of hunters that started the North American yes. model of uh, uh, conservation North America. Yeah, that's and a I, great story. Teddy Rose, it's a great Teddy Roosevelt yes. story <laughs> of where this all initiated. And I would encourage, you know, friend to friend, peer to peer, family is where we can make the biggest difference. You know, oftentimes we say, well, we got a regulator, we got to require. You know what, in my experience, it's when you are a friend and say, you know what, you shouldn't be doing that. Or like I'm teaching my daughter how to hunt. Hey, we respect the animal as much after it's down as we did beforehand and we butcher it ourselves yeah. and we take care of this stuff and when we see someone doing something yeah you don't want to get in a fight but you can there are ways to influence other people i had the fortunate opportunity to hunt in namibia uh five or six years ago and i was amazed at how much those professional hunters took care of that game after the after the kill and how the pitchers and the respect and everything else and and i learned from it and now when, you know, I'm out in the field and I want to take some, some memories with my camera, I have taken some of that and applied it to my, you know, and I've been hunting almost 40 years. So, it was, I mean, it's, it's a great thing. And, um, you know, I just say go to those websites, you know, engage yeah. with this stuff. It, well, it is critical to the future of hunting that we do that. Another thing HuntFairChase.com has is, is recommendations on how if you're engaging with someone who doesn't know or understand hunting but may not be opposed or if you're engaging with somebody who is opposed how how you can have the conversation or, or what what the best way to deal with that conversation if someone's adversarial yep. and i think that's because there is there are still respectful ways to to, to handle that conversation oh, very much so very much so, so. Uh, and now you as on the mdf board you've been involved more on the marketing and camp uh, communications mm -hmm. as well so tell me what you envision going on with mdf as you have your swan song <laughs> on the board and move it forward now, we have made so much progress uh just focusing on mis mission and message um so you know mule deer is a unique challenge so secretary zinke was here a few days ago talking about mule deer being the bellwether for for a healthy economy, kind of like the canary in the coal mine, so to speak. And, and, I, and I think people need to understand that there are, uh, you know, things that bene benefit some species are a disadvantage to other species. So as you're managing these things, it's not just a one, a one size fits all approach. You know, there are times when trees need to be taken down, fires need to be set. 
you know, land management is is crucial, and it doesn't always look pretty. It's, there, there's there's mess before the undergrowth all right. grows back, and. When I'm telling my kid to clean a room, I say it always <laughs> looks worse before it gets better. <laughs> you know, and so if people take pictures of the mess and say, look what they're doing to our lands, that's a, that's a misdirection. It's, it's, it's disinformation. Because once that's all done, those landscapes come back in a much more healthy way. And rather than waiting for catastrophic wildfires to do our work for us, you know, the best way to sequester carbon is to keep it in trees <laughs> and to yeah. keep, and to, you know. To the forage, into the ground, know, yeah. The, you the, just, yep. if, you, if you do these things correctly, it's so effective. And, and, and one thing I'll just, a super pet peeve of mine is, you know, every lawsuit against a fish and wildlife agency is dollars that will not be there for the benefit of the landscape, uh, the flora, fauna, the wildlife. That just, that kills me. I think people need to understand and they need to feel very angry that these, these uh, uh, institutions like the Humane Society, every lawsuit they file is actually damaging wildlife. It is not helping wildlife. It is damaging wildlife. Yep. Yep. Takes the money where, away from the management that goes it on. It does. So money and focus. If, if, yeah. if you have a... A fish and wildlife executive that's that's now focused on some ridiculous lawsuit rather than how to strategically manage an area, we've all lost big yep. time. Yep. Well, CJ, thank you. I know you're busy over here. Uh, I, I I will say um, we didn't quite get away from the noise from the booth because so, somebody wanted a sharpened knife. Well, we were <laughs> 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 you couldn't sign it, but they got it sharpened. But <laughs> but you know what? That's what makes the show great. Is yeah. there's it you is. know again, it's that hands on, and people can come here and have a service done to their yes. eyes or everything. But thank you for your years of conservation work. Oh, uh, and, and, and thank for you for a quality product, a quality company, and your service to the conservation world. So, My pleasure. Thank you so much. So for now, this is Jody Stemler. And I'm Steve Belinda. Until next time, we'll talk to you. Thanks for talking Mule Deer with Steve Belinda and Jody Stemler. The Mule Deer Foundation is the only conservation group in North America dedicated to restoring, improving, and protecting mule deer and black-tailed deer and their habitat. MDF is a strong voice for hunters in access, wildlife management, and conservation policy issues. To find out more, visit www.muledeer.org and stay tuned for the next episode of Talkin' Mule Deer.